So I'm Christopher Donahue, an HGRI historian, and I'm here with Dr. Jane Rogers. Dr. Rogers is the former head of sequencing at Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. She was also a part of the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. So to begin, uh, tell me a little bit about when and where you were born and your early life and, and education. Okay, so I was um, born in 1954 in Southampton in, in the UK. And I was brought up from the age of two in a small market town in Wiltshire, so in the southwest of England. And I had a what I suppose would be a traditional state school education, um, which fortunately for me had not been um, messed about with too much by the time I went through it. So it was fairly standard grammar school, academically oriented ed education. And they turned me out at the other end with you know, exam qualifications to go off to university. Um, and I, in, um, I went off to uh, Southampton University uh, at the age of 18 to study biochemistry with physiology. Was there any uh, teacher, mentor uh, early in your life who made you really interested in science, biology, genetics? Typically, when I interview scientists, there's a there's a decisive early influence on on, on and that allows them to, uh, people to inf uh, to study science in a way that um, uh, that is usual for the profession. So I suppose a, an early influence on me came from my father. He was a pharmacist. And um, his training included uh, chemistry and biology. And we used to talk about that. And he used to talk um, about, uh, you know, we used to, he used to help me with homework. Um, and we also used to enjoy um, walking upon the chalk downlands in Wiltshire and talking about the specific flora and fauna that you find. And he would intersperse this with information about um, you know the medicinal compounds that had come from various plants that that we saw. So that that's one influence. Um, the second influence, I suppose, was at was at school with uh, a chemistry master in particular, who encouraged me. One particular anecdote: we it's a classic experiment that you do and you get prepared for and can be explosive and in my case was explosive <laughs> i wasn't listening properly about where i should heat the the piece of cotton wool that contained the the water to make the steam to interact with magnesium and it whooshed up the test tube and out the other end and uh, he at that point he walked over he could see i was mortified actually and shook my hand and say every true scientist has at least one explosion and i thought that was just wonderful <laughs> But uh, no, he was a great influence and very, very encouraging um, and encouraged a, a group of us actually to sort of go to study beyond the, the normal A-level um, syllabus in, in chemistry. Uh, and that was that was helpful. So and what was your university education like? Uh, what did you study? Um, and uh, for your doctoral work, who was your supervisor? So I, I um, went to Southampton University to study biochemistry with physiology. Um, I was interested in biology and chemistry. Biochemistry seemed to um, combine the two. And, and I was also interested in how things work. So the physiology would, would you know, cover that, that part. And um, I think one of the things I liked about it, not only the environment of the university, it was a very new department at the time, but um, it was, it looked as though that there were multiple options. You know, you could either focus later on down the biochemistry route or the physiology, and they even had a, a brand new medical department if that was a, an area that I wanted to go in later. Um, and in my third year, um, we had an influx of new lecturers into the department. So it brought a lot of new blood, a lot of new research ideas. And I decided that I would I would stay um, at Southampton for my PhD, and I did a, a, a PhD a, a project that was co-supervised by one of the the new lecturers, one of the older lecturers, and we um, I spent three years looking at 
the behavior of fluorescent sterols in, in membranes of, of different types. So how did you first uh, meet John Sulston and sort of get into the orbit of John Sulston and, <laughs> and, and, and just uh, as, do you have one or two anecdotes about sort of meeting him and him as a person and him, him in those early years? Um, well, I, I think John was, you know, sort of really quite established by the time I met him. I met John in, in 1992. Um, by that time, I had uh, been, uh, I'd, I'd worked in Cambridge for about 10 years as a postdoc researcher and um, not really wanting to go continue trying down the, the lecturer route, etc. Um, I'd gone off to the Medical Research Council, Council to become um, a scientific administrator. Um, I had a young son at the time. I was commuting to London and the commute was hard work in those days. And uh, I was asked if there were any positions available in Cambridge. And I happened to ask at the time that John was asking for administrative help to set up the, um, the proposal, so put the proposal into the Wellcome Trust for a large sequencing facility. So we discovered that we lived in the same village and um, I, he invited me to come around and talk to himself and Alan Coulson, his colleague working on the worm, uh, one evening on my way home from work. And um, I, I've recorded it ever since as a sort of bizarre interview. So there I was, you know, sitting in the rocking chair in his front room being asked all sorts of questions by himself and Alan about, you know, how how you manage budgets, um, how how would you set up a, a, a you know sort of what what is now called human resources department, and could I could I turn a, a an office block into into a laboratory facility, and um, <laughs> after two glasses of sherry on an empty stomach. I could do anything really, and um, John obviously thought that I he could work with me. Um, so we arranged the the MR, he arranged with the MRC for me to be seconded to Cambridge to work on the um, developing the the proposal to the Wellcome Trust and and that submission. And then once the the Wellcome Trust said yes, then he asked if I'd like to work with him on the administrative side and to to get the um, the lab up and going. So do you happen to <laughs> yeah, do you happen to remember any of your answers and in, in, in <laughs> uh, 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 for that interview uh, oh, I, can, I, can I can remember with the lab block I can remember talking about you know theoretically how I would would go about it I mean subsequently I realized that they had a an, an office block in in mind there was a a new office complex that had been built in Cambridge quite near the airport. And we, we later went out and saw it, but you know the, the basically it had been set up as an office block, so there were no wet resources. So that's one of the things we had to to think about, and then we had to think about you know computing um, power supply. Where would you, you know whether it had enough power supply? And John was particularly always particularly concerned with whether there would be any backup power supply. You know we always had to have a generator. Um, he got very anxious about that, and, and when we were at the Sangha, we sort of made sure that he knew how how to start the generator if it ever went, if it was ever necessary. Um, so, the, so certainly the the lab block answers I, I can sort of vaguely remember. Um, you know, sort of about how how to set all that up. Um, yeah, <laughs> we seem to we seem to get along, and I, I you know again afterwards. Uh, John said, you know, he usually, I mean, I, I did a lot of recruitment with John, so a lot of interviewing with, with John. And and he told me later that, you know, he generally decided whether he could work with somebody or not after about five minutes. And that was absolutely apparent in his interviews too, because if if he found somebody was not interesting, then I had to take over the interview and make sure that um, the candidate felt that we had, you know, explored everything properly. But, um, yeah. <laughs> So, that, was, that was my interview. That was my introduction to John and, and, and to Alan. 
So in, in 92, had you really heard anything about um, this so-called human genome project? Uh, and and what did you what did you think? What did the people around you what did the people around you think? So no, I hadn't heard directly about it, although um, there was within the MRC head office, there was a lot of talk about more more of the funding having to be allocated to the molecular sciences division. Um, that was the area that funded the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and their funding was ring fenced. So they they were um, already working um, on the John was already working on the map of the the worm at, at that point. So whole genomes were in their you know in in their sites. But um, no, I think there was just a, a concern about general concern about what you know how molecular work was was going to go and and i mean for the mrc it was a real worry about where where the money would come from because the budgets were very certainly very tight at that time and and that proved the case later because the mrc um struggled to find the money to you know support support the worm project let alone do very much with the human so you said that that uh, budgets were were pretty limited during that time. Was there any? This is a related point. Was there any time at which the the budgets were sort of ample or more than you expected, or was it always a kind of sort of scarcity 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 scenario? Uh, well, I think when we, I mean, we put in um an application to the welcome trust for the sangha for, for a budget for 60 million pounds for five years which you know was an enormous amount of money and they said yes and we realized that you know we we obviously had to set up system we, we were promising a lot for that and um the costs at the time certainly you know wouldn't allow us to 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 achieve it so right from the outset we had to work on how to make sequencing as cost effective as as possible and and you know how to maximize the use of the sequencing machines we were all, i mean we, we always looked at the budgets they i mean the welcome trust were generous um i think you know sign and and i think i can't say any more than that we we were we were very lucky a lot of you know we weren't we never had to think about washing perpetits which certainly you know in the uk some labs were having to do not very long before that um so that 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 was never you know something that we had to worry about that much mm -hmm. but we had to be careful and we had to you know be we as i say we we had to make the money go as far as we could so as a related question, um, in some, what was uh, John Sulston's contribution to sort of the, the worm, the worm mapping and sequencing uh, project? I mean, how, could you summarize his, his contribution and, in, in, or try to in two or, in two or three points? And, and the John's, yeah, John's contribution to the, to the worm was, so he, he, um, he and Alan developed the Cosmid map of the worm. Um, and John led the sequencing. So, and John established the first sequencing group. That was in the LMB. Um, and that set the model for all of the other sequencing teams, certainly initially within, within the Sanger. Um, he worked, he did the subcloning himself for the, for the sequencing project. So he's very hands-on and he enjoyed working in the lab. And he worked through the, the sequencing methods. Initially on the map, he had persuaded Richard Durbin to develop a, um, a sort of visualization tool for the, for the, um, the, the bands, the digestive bands, so that they could put together the, the mapped cos cosmids. Um, and take advantage of the automated automa automatic reading of the, the of the um, scans. But then he, for the sequencing, um, I 
they worked with Roger Staden um, on, I mean, essentially burgling the applied biosystems, so burgling into the applied biosystems software and being able to, you know, get at the code. And from that, Roger went on to, to develop um, the BAP and, and GAP visualization databases, which the sequences all used for uh, assessing the, the sequence reads and the, and the sequence assemblers. So, um, and later on in the WORM project, he, he, he led the first team. We set up two, two teams with, um, with postdocs that were working in that original team. And then we had two further teams that John essentially supervised. So he was very much aware of what the problems were. He did problem solving. He um, looked at the um, resolution of, of you know, the how, to, how to overcome some of these problems. So the use of the short, short insert libraries, you call shutter, I mean, in the US, they were called shutter libraries. This is, John, John worked that up with, with one of the, the finishers um, and used it for the really gnarly bits of, of the, the um, worm cosmids. And then he finished the final gaps. He sort of plugged away at, you know, isolating the DNA and, and finishing the final gaps on the worm. So I think that's his contribution to the worm project. <laughs> So he did the sequence finishing basically himself. He, yes, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a very laborious process. So. It is, it is. And he, by the time he got the last gaps filled, he had actually stepped down as director of Sanger. But, you know, he, and he was meticulous about negotiating paint space, access to the resources that he needed to actually get that finished I mean it was trivial by the time you know by comparison with the huge budgets that we were spending then but it's absolutely meticulous about about negotiating that to, to get to finish the worm off so how important as a related question how important was it for John and the Sanger that there be kind of a complete map and a complete sequence versus say just various you know regions of interest or or just finding uh, genes of interest. I mean, how how important was it that it be basically whole genomes? And um, you know, where did I think, what is the significance of that? Um, I think the significance is that you have a good idea about what you might find and what you might do with the you know regions of so-called interest but what you don't know is in in the in the other bits but you don't know anything about what's in what's in the other bits but if you have a complete sequence you can go back to that in the future you have the data there you can explore it and you know there's all sorts of things that we don't know about we still don't know about genome regulation and quite a few of those are in some of the trickier bits to, to sequence and, and, and get at. And by having that whole genome, you have a, you have a template that you can, work, you can then work from and, and, and start to look at some of these, the, you know, the, these um, yeah, unknown features, shall we say. So we touched on this a little bit, but how how precisely do you kind of set up this the sequencing center? Uh, just in general terms, I mean, um, and keep it keep it running. I mean, how so you how do you recruit postdocs, um, beta test technology, uh, you know, making sure that that the groups work well together, issues issues like that. So um, well, the, the, we set out with this notion of replicating what John had built at the at the LMB. Um, so in fact the whole of the, the the original building at the at the Sanger was based on the projection that we would have 17 sequencing teams, <laughs> a nice you know precise number, plus one subcloning lab. So you know there were 18 labs that were allocated to to, to sequencing um, and 
the, the, there was a structure within the in within the team. So there was a, a team leader. Um, and then there were people doing sequence um, sequence preparation, sequence finishing. And um, originally there was a, a subcloner in each of those teams as well. And that was the so that was a sort of model that we started out with. We started out from John's single team duplicating that and having two nematode teams led by two postdocs in the original team. They recruited staff to work with them. But we also, uh, at the same time of working as, as recruiting technicians, we also recruited people who were going to become team leaders of further groups, so postdocs, who would then work, spend some time working with the, with the, you know, in the initial teams, learn how everything worked, and then be able to take it out and, and set up their own groups. Um, and we were quite successful in, in doing that initially. And we had, so that we had the two nematode teams that started, and we also had Bart Burrell's group um, from the LMB, and they were, were working on yeast. So Carol Churcher headed that up. And we recruited, um, a, similarly, team leaders who worked with Carol initially to learn how to do it. And then we, we recruited into, in, into the other positions within the teams. And for postdocs, um, I think we must have gone to nature or and science for those initial, and that new, it would be new scientist as well for those initial um, adverts. And then after that, when we were advertising for technicians, we went we lo we advertised locally. I mean, Cambridge has a you know vast scientific population, um, and we were very lucky in that respect. So you know, big university lots of scientific departments and um, and and a lot of the time um we were also looking for people who sort of had an interest in science but weren't scientific scientists themselves but were technically inclined and and the ads always had had in them you know we we looked for manual dexterity and often um interest in computing so you know computer hackers were or always found favour, um, and and people who we, we used to give the certainly the technicians a, a pipetting test as part of the interviews, so that we could <laughs> we could check two things actually you know get people to pipette just water into a, a microtiter plate. Um, you could see whether their eyesight was any good, which was quite important, and you could also then see you know what the the manual dexterity was. Um, um, and, and th I think that's where most of our recruits came from. Once we got going a little bit, then people heard heard of us. Then um, we would have applications from postdocs to you know if, if there were any posts going. But if it was more on the technical side, then the ads were, would all be um, all be in the local local news. Um, <laughs> then how do we get going from there? So so. Building the groups is, is step one. And initially we had um, all of the sequencing work going on in the group. But when you're working in a, in a lab and the LMB is you know, very well set up, there were central resources that needed to be replicated because we, were, we, we set up the Sanger initially in what had been an old lab building on a country house estate site uh, outside Cambridge. I mean, that's where the, I mean, Hingston is, is where the site is now. But we move, We originally had to do a refurbishment of, a, of, a, of an old, um, it was a sort of electronics lab, I think, that, that was there originally. So um, they, what was I saying? The, um, Yes, yeah, so the central services that we that we had to set up certain things like, um, you know, what the things you, you really think about you take for granted in a lab: the washing up, the um, pouring of of agar plates for all the you know the the back, bacterial culture growth and so on. Um, the um, and and the 
pouring the gel plates for the, the sequencers, because we started off with uh, polycrylamide gels poured you know, for, for the initial sequencers. And that we found was better done as a, a central activity rather than the individual teams doing their own. Um, and uh, what else do we have to, oh, the other central activities, I suppose that had to be some of the other lab focused activities. We decided to put a separate group for subcloning fairly fairly early on as well. Initially, the group's teams were going to have their own subcloner, but it worked much better with the subcloning team being very specialised. You know, postdocs were doing their own development work um, as we went along, as well as um, overseeing the routine production of, of um, subclones for, for, for the sequencing project. Um, um, from there, having so the the sequencing was initially within within the teams um as time went on we built the capacity we looked at how to automate it um use of pipetting robots initially um we had colony picker that was developed in house in fact it, it was able to pick m13 plaques as well as pick colonies. Um, and it always struck me as, as ironic that I can't remember the name of the, the company who produced the colony pickers that were used in just about every other large sequencing center, except ours, because we actually had our own. And this company is a British company. <laughs> but um, so, and we, but setting up sequencing reactions tended to be manual for quite a long time, actually, because of the problem of not wanting to waste the sequencing mix. That was so valuable that we, you know, putting that in trays and troughs to be allocated out. Um, we, you know, we needed at least um, sort of level two and level three robots um, working before before we got to that. So we built up in the teams, we needed more sequencers. We had to, um, we initially added sequencers into the, the sequencer teams, but then it grew beyond that. And it made sense to look at centralizing various activities. And this I think was probably in parallel with, with other groups doing, you know, doing similar. Um, the, so the, moving the sequencers to a, a central facility and having dedicated sequence loaders, which went with the sequence plate production initially. Um, and then we, we had, um, we, we separated, a, a, this was the real scale up for the, for the human genome project. We separated the production staff from the finishing staff. So we have production teams, we have finishing teams because they do, they do different things. Um, how do we keep that all going and keep people talking? Well, meetings, lots and lots of meetings, lots and lots of communication. Did we always get it right? Certainly not. Um, people, you know, people used to get upset and feel that they were you know, not being taken any notice of and being un overlooked. And to be honest, it's, it's a delicate balance, um, especially for postdocs, between working in an environment which you know was I mean it was labeled a factory environment um, and thinking about their career development as well as um, you know doing a, a job that was producing a product uh, along alongside others and, and couldn't be distinguished from it from the point of view of, of uh, you know their own publications and, and career development. So it, it was um, it, it was a balancing act at times, uh, but we had you know we had regular meetings. We had a development group um, which was initially quite small. John and I used to run that between us, and they would take on either projects that the that the teams wanted some assistance with, or they would take on project other sort of side projects. When I, when I think about things, we had a group doing um, CPG Island sequencing fairly near the beginning of this enterprise. I mean, what a terrible thing to try and sequence. But um, 
uh, Adrian Bird in Edinburgh you know, asked us if we could do this and we thought, oh, we ought to be able to do these things. So we, we had a group looking at that. It was never terribly successful because they were, I mean, some of those are ferocious and you know, so so tricky to sequence through. And the chemistry just really wasn't right for doing that at the time. Um, Terminator chemistry wasn't in, you know, it was coming along, but certainly was not hugely advanced. And primer sequencing chemistry didn't seem to get through them very well at all. So, uh, yeah. So does that explain, have I explained how, how no, we grew that? No, perfectly. That's great. Uh, one thing I wanted to follow up on is you've mentioned before the that when you basically got a, a sequencing platform, oftentimes it didn't work quite correctly. So yes. could you just sort of describe the your beta testing process? If, if, if that's one way to describe how to how to essentially adapt a sequencing machine to to lab to your group or lab where it actually produces sequence. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the, one of the um, I mean, the, the sequencers as they came, we didn't have the. I suppose the, the the earliest sequencers came out in the automated sequencers were came out in 1990. So there was a certain amount, you know, of of testing and and working out how to use them that had gone on for two years, two three years before we we got going. So we weren't at the the most basic stage, but. Yes, we had to, um, well, I suppose a step back from that, one of the first things we had to do was to set up mean a tracking system that would provide a sort of centralised output of how many you know, sequences, sequence reads we had and you know, what the, the overall pass rate was for them. Um, and because always, I mean, it's like, it's like anything that, you know, that there are always mitigating circumstances. If your sequencer doesn't generate sequence, it's not only, it's not only could be due to the sequencer, but it could also be due to what you put on it. And that, you know, that ranges from what the individual groups were generating to the gels and, you know, lots and lots of other things. So. We had to have this tracking system so that we could see where, where the faults arose. But one of the one of the faults that just sticks in my mind, ABI changed something on the must have been on the three seven three sequencers, and it was a um, the oh, what do they call it? Sorry, it'll come back to me. It was it was part of the mechanism that that um, shuttled the 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 lamp backwards of the yeah the back backwards and forwards across the across the front of the gel and it was they they changed a I think it was a metal component for something that was definitely cheaper and a bit plasticky lead screw the lead screw that's it that, that was rep needed for for moving this thing backwards and forwards and we had lead screw after lead screw breaking. So we had machines breaking down in, in the middle of runs. And the reps in, in the UK decided that, you know, they were talking to ABI California about this and saying, you know, this is very good and so on. And Sanger are, are very cross about it. Um, so they took me out to California and they also took David Bentley. And I put up a um, presentation for for you know what we were finding, and I I think we'd had I forget how many in the course of about three months we'd had something like fifty lead screws have broken. It was a tremendous number, and you know ABI the, the room was quite packed, and you know mouths more or less opened at the at the sheer volume. And at that point, I think they realised, hey, we were a serious player. There was something funny going on on that island, um, the other side of the world. But B, also, you know, we, we, you know, there was something that needed looking at and fixing. But the, um, yeah, I think that I heard a report. Belefkovich was apparently heard to say, "Who is that woman?" 
<laughs> so uh, <laughs> yes, and and then and the other thing, I the, my uh, my other big beef was that you know, these machines, you paid the price of a Rolls Royce for these machines. You jolly well expected it to you know run like a Rolls Royce, and um, they some they they had lots and lots of faults. In fact, we had we actually employed our own engineer for well it must have been for yeah two about you know two years who was the first port of call in terms of coming out looking at the machines deciding whether he had to call in people from um our local abi um service area or or whether he could he could actually fix the machines but um uh, Yes, it was it was fun and games getting those, and and this was something that John got very um, uh, excited about because you know he was very well aware that in order to maximise the, the the sequencers were the most expensive piece of machinery, therefore they had to be used to you know, maximum capacity, uh, and when we kept having these problems, it was a it was it was an issue. Now, that's a really illuminating series of stories and something that I've that I've always wondered about and always ask people sort of the, the, around the same question. How do you kind of test out these sequencers once they get into your labs and what and what happens? And, and there's kind of a unanimity of, of, of uh, oh, we have to change lots of things that they didn't work very well. Or we had to employ our own engineer, for example. Fairly common. Um, one one other thing to to just ask you is, um, when did the Sanger um, start basically human human sequencing specifically? What year what year was it? And did you have was there a year in which there was a kind of a turning point in which all of the sudden there was there was a significant amount of sequence? Being being generated much more than the year before, where you basically said, "Yeah, they we're really making a ton of progress," uh, where progress before had been a bit more incremental or, or something like that. I think so. The first the first human projects that we took on were actually in 1993, and that was um, a couple of. I mean, we had. Some cosmids from the Huntington's um, region on chromosome four, um, and we had some X chromosome and actually some chromosome twenty two cosmids. So both of the X, both the X and the twenty two came from David Bentley's group, and they were really um, sort of pilot projects uh, to to look at whether cosmids were suitable sequencing templates. Um, and progress, we used the, the same techniques on those as we were using on the worm, and it was clear they were not as easy to assemble. And in fact, it wasn't until some further work had been done, you know, on the, um, when Fred and Frapp were introduced, FRAP in particular, to, to assemble the, the clones, um, that it began to look a bit more viable. So those early projects, I mean, they started off at the beginning. We didn't do a huge amount. And the other thing that they did illustrate, though, to us was that cosmids were not a good um, uh, template for the for sequencing. Um, the overlaps were between the clones were too large, and that reflected the fact that the um, the mapping that mapping of cosmids was not ideal for the human genome either. So David took that on board and um, and started work with with large insert clones, and we worked with the pack libraries from Peter Dion. So was there a point where things started to go more smoothly? <laughs> You'd hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> I think um, when we got through, the, you know, the initial teething problems with the with the sequencers, um, probably 
95, 96, things started to take an, an upward turn. By the end of 96, we'd finished the East project. So that felt like a, a significant milestone. Um, the worm was, you know, trundling along nicely. That seemed to be under control. And we were starting to make some inroads with the, with the larger insert human clones. Um, yeah, I think, I think I would say 95, 96. So that really coincides with the, you know, the timing of the, the first Bermuda meeting as well. Um, and and you answered the question I also should have asked you, which is what were the challenges of say human human sequencing versus another another model, and was was there anything specific to human that you needed to to modify or change? The, the repeat sequence, the re, repeat repeat sequences were were a problem, um, and Frapp yeah, Frapp actually did a good job at, at the assemblies. Uh, it did, we were using the Staden assembler before that, and uh, and Frat was a was a better thing to turn to. Um, what else happened at that time? We we I think it was around that time that the focus moved from using the primer chemistry, fluorescent primers, to the um, fluorescent terminators, and that was a better sequencing chemistry. That. Um, yeah, I think I think those those two things. You've mentioned David Bentley several times. I mean, just to go into kind of sort of who who he is and and you know what what he did at, at Sanger and kind of how he how he came to Sanger would be really really interesting because I've Have interviewed him. Him? Yeah, yeah, I've interviewed him as well. So yeah, yeah no, David. Um, when John was looking at the the initial project. So John's interest was in, in the worm, um, the well, in, but Aaron Klug, who was the head of the LMB, realized that if the UK, if the UK were going to keep John here and, and working on you know, genomes, and especially the worm genome, that's Funding had to be found. I mentioned earlier that the MRC, you know, would not have had the money to to support this. So it was Aaron that went to talk to uh, Bridget Ogilvy, who was then head of the Wellcome Trust. And the well, Wellcome's view was that they would um, they wouldn't support the worm project, but they were very interested in translation of the technology to the Human Genome Project and to the UK making a substantial contribution to, to the human genome sequence. Because um, they seem to have taken it on board already that you know, mapping and sequencing would um, open up a lot of new, new avenues and, and that the human genome sequence you know, would need to be done. And that of course follows on the, the, um, all of the, the meetings in, in the United States. So when John thought about the, you know, the obviously he um, the the which projects are we going to be part of the of, of the work at the Sanger, his interests were he brought the worm, but bought the the yeast, and he um, thought of David for the the human uh, human genetics element because David and Ian Dunham had been working at Guy's and they had talked to John about um, the software, especially that he was using for both the, the mapping, yeah, for, for, the, for the mapping at the time and the ACDB software for, for the, the analysis. So he, that's how John knew of David and he knew that David was not just another Human gene hunter, that he he was interested in in the ge genome side of things. So he invited David to uh, join and be part of the proposal. So David's component for you know the mapping and um, mapping side of the um, the human 
genome element was um, was included in, in the actual um, proposal with the with the sequencing, which really came out of John's side of things because it was the the translation from the other organisms. And David joined. Well, he was. Um, I think he must have come in around September ninety three. It's the sequencing labs. We got the sequencing labs open in spring of 93. And there was a, a in, in the building that we had, it was a sort of E-shaped, and the, the the E had a long arm in the middle, and that was the the human genetics area. And that took a little longer to to set up for, for David. So I think, yes, I think it must have been autumn 93 when when he came. And he brought the, um, his group from the from from guys. So one other follow up question is between ninety two and ninety three, the American leadership of the Human Genome Project changes pretty radically with Jim Watson and then Michael Gottesman and then Francis Collins coming on. Um, how how did did that affect you uh, at Sanger, and what was your kind of perception of? Of that of that transition transition period because Sanger was founded while well, Michael Gottesman was was acting director, for example. I think I think all of that was sort of above my pay grade at the time. Um, the only I think the the significant part that I was aware of was probably Jim going because. Jim had been instrumental in getting the, you know, in setting up the funding for the for the worm worm map, and then persuading John and Bob to to go forward with the sequencing. And I think it was Jim. Jim had organised the the initial funding for the first megabase, which was shared between the two labs. So there was there was US money going into the into the LMB for that. So, so I think there was a little bit of apprehension because they were aware that Jim was very supportive, and they didn't know what the you know what what the follow up would be. And do you remember any specific, or do you have any specific uh, thoughts about you know once Francis becomes the the guides starts guiding the U.S. effort? You know what his specific contributions to the HTP were, and you know, in terms of managerial style or his his sort of public uh, guidance of the program, or or his how he worked with the with the sequencing centers and so on and so forth. So that came, you know, quite a lot later. I don't think I was really aware of Francis until probably around the time of the first Bermuda meeting. And that was that that was probably because you know David had the the contacts. He 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 knew Francis from 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 the um, especially from the Cold Spring Harbor type contact uh, and previous sort of human genetics existence. Um, so it was really about the time of the Bermuda, Bermuda meeting that I I you know first became conscious of, of Francis and the, of what he was doing. But for a while, you know, it must have been for another year or so beyond that, the, there didn't seem to be any, any really concerted US effort. The, the work, obviously the map, there had been a, a, a mapping program and the initial sequencing started, I mean, as it did with us for the human sequencing, we centers were picking up bits and pieces that people had mapped previously. And um, a lot of it in cosmids and and you know not in not in the larger clones. So all of the larger clone work was starting to be developed. So it wasn't really, I suppose, until 1998 when the Bermuda meeting of that year um, made it so clear that the the US was still floundering a little bit, and um, 
we didn't see what direction they were, they were going to go in. And we decided that we needed to go back to the Wellcome Trust and, you know, up the ante on our side, as it were, to try and prompt some action from our international partners. Um, at that point, uh, you know, Francis started to, started to loom, uh, you know, more and was obviously working with the, talking with the genome centres about, about, about the, um, you know, what, what, what could be done. But then I think, you know, the, the sudden rise of Solera, uh, it must have knocked him for six. And in some ways, I, you know, I wonder whether, you know, he was thinking, oh, well, that's all right. You know, it's going to be done. Um, and we don't have to pay for it because it's, you know, it's an expensive project. How, how, how do we organise it? Uh, Bob had been working with us, uh, well, Bob, not, I mean, sort of uh, in parallel with us and had, had funding to do very similar things to, to the things that we were doing. Um, but other centres weren't as far advanced um, at, at all. So when we went to, so we went to the Work and Trust because we were so worried about it. And it, you know, on the day that we made our presentation to the Work and Trust to increase our share of the human genome from a sixth, which is what we set out to do, to a third, that was the day that Craig was making his presentation to the to the groups at, at Cold Spring Harbour and saying, well, you know, I'm doing all this, you can go and do the mouse. Um, so it was, you know, very much in, in parallel, but the discussions with Francis, you know, really um, got moving after that. And then Francis was working as the coordinator of the with with the different groups. Um, and 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 pulling a coherent project together. There were some ups and downs in that, as we've you know mentioned before, in terms of what the what the strategy was actually going to be, but um, that there should be a public project um, really came into focus at that point, and that the Americans, unless you know, they need to 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 really come together. Now my perception, you know, may not re reflect the truth, but I think it, it's it was just you know what I I was recalling at the time. No, it's it's really interesting because in the period that you're describing, from say roughly Bermuda '96 to roughly Solaris, when you have the sequencing pilots, um, mm -hmm. and then you have the quality assessment exercises, um, and uh, then you have uh, basically the, the sequencing tensors finally producing uh, some some sequence, uh, <laughs> but 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 it, uh, but as Bob told me last week, it was it was something along what he had proposed, but at a, uh, at, at a much sort of lower lower level than than uh, than he he thought could. Than, than that he had proposed. So, but that's an interesting, um, that's a very interesting view because uh, that, no, that's that's actually quite quite remarkable. I'm, I'm not, yeah, that's no. So what was the, what was the, your perception, for example, of the quality assessment exercises um, where you had uh, basically, uh, the everyone's sequence was essentially a, a quality assessed by by another another group, and I think it happened in um, ninety. Well, the first round was in ninety seven. Was that was that useful to, to to your group? And and were there any surprises? I, you know, it was useful. It, it, it was it, it was useful to. It's always useful to have you know feedback. Um, Yes, I, what were the surprises? Yeah, some of our clones didn't come up as well as they should have done, I thought. <laughs> but there were, you know, there were, we were doing things, we were, we were doing things differently. And that accounted, that certainly accounted for some of it. Um, but, you know, it's a good, it's a good wake up call. And I suppose, you know, one of the things that we 
always reckoned to do was to smooth things out in the finishing stage. Um, but again, having some, you know, intermediate feedback on on how we were doing on that. No, it was it was a useful thing to take part in. Painful, um, very laborious. I seem to remember and can't remember. I can't quite remember whether the whether the first exercise involved us resequencing and reassembling. I think it must have done actually um, to do to do that comparison. So yeah, yes, I believe so. Was, yeah. Yeah, so it took quite a bit of effort to to do it, but yes, no, it was um, it was useful. It was useful. And and what in your this is before I ask you about the uh, the library development, which is not a topic that that gets much attention, although it really should. Um, what was so? Were you at the the ninety six Bermuda meeting? And yes, yes, and so. So just in two or three, uh, you know, two or three points, what was the, what really was the significance of, of, of that meeting and in particular sort of, not simply the data release, but the ac accuracy and contiguity standards? I mean, uh, how did, the, how was your assessment of the significance of those features as well? Well, uh, accuracy. This is the ba the base pair accuracy. Um, you know, I can't. You know, to be absolutely honest, I can't remember much discussion of that at the time. But maybe that's just because it didn't come up in the bullet points in the end. I mean, we we had we had previously been working with Bob's group and agree. I think we had the agreement that the sequence should be double stranded it needed you, know, you have to have a strand going in each direction really to be able to call to, to call the assembly accurately the thread quality had to be q20 or above which meant that you know the base error in a, a single base error had a probability of less than um one in a hundred of oh, sorry a base had one in a hundred prob probability of being an error so you were saying that that was that was a high quality base call, and when you put those together, then then you came up with a with the FRAP score. But it really fell out of those those scores that we were using all the time. Um, so did it make a significant impact on me? No, because we were essentially already doing it. Did we need a wake up call to make sure that our sequence really was that accurate? Yes. Um, yes, we did. And that, that came with, with, with the exercises. The, the contiguity, again, the, side, the, the data release was based on what, what had been going on with the worm. And the assembled sequences were released onto the HTTP server um, uh, when they, they've been assembled in context of more than 1 KB, because that way you got rid of, you know, sort of sequencing vector and cloning vector and, and managed to screen, screen that out. Um, so it was, should be the organism that you are trying to sequence. Not necessarily from where you thought it was from, but certainly, you know, what you were trying to sequence. And they apparently, I mean, I had to check on this, but at the time of the first Bermuda meeting, the databases didn't take unfinished sequence. So the, 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 the sequence, date, the assembled data was going out onto individual websites and could, could be searched there. And it wasn't until I think it might have been the second Bermuda meeting when there was a discussion of having the phase one, the phase two and the phase three quality. Uh, and that it was agreed that the sequence would be put out with those labels on it. Um, yeah. Is, is, was that because GenBank had a, had specific specific stand uh, specific standards that the the 
that were onerous to, to meet before they could deposit it. That's why some of the sequence was going on individual websites, or is that a different? Uh, I think I think it I think it was just I mean I think it was just one of those things that nobody really talked to to GenBank about putting the you know unfinished sequence out. But when the it was it was undoubtedly useful for the worm. And I you could say that you know the the way that the worm sequence was released, it was picked up, it was used. It was a useful thing for the community. And when the first Bermuda discussion took place, it seemed an appropriate time to talk about, you know, immediate release of the of the sequence data and to release the unfinished data. Which people, you know, sort of nodded to as bob said previously you know how much they really took in what this was going to mean i'm not sure but um yeah it was it was i think it was the utility and, and the fact that it was going to be you know the human genome project was going to be a long project it was going to be very expensive and a lot of people weren't going to be part of the project so making the data available so that it could be used as soon as possible that was very much, you know, one of John's major, I think, contributions to the to, to the Human Genome Project. Well, a, be a better way of asking a question about the Bermuda meeting is what took up most of the discussion? <laughs> <laughs> I think most of the discussion was um, The first part of the discussion was very much who was doing what. And, and that was a sort of introduction, as it were, uh, you, know, you know, because the initial inv invitee list was was quite large. And it was people who had done who were taking up sequencing on the back of, of previous mapping projects. And some people and, and some people had, you know, 10 cosmids, and that was a significant sequencing project. But it, it was sort of being, it was to be inclusive initially. And then we'd look at, you know, who had funding and who was serious about, about scaling up. And I think probably, you know, when, when we and WashU in particular started talking about what we were doing, it became clear that, you know, this was going to be, this was a, a serious, effort where you, 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 know, you can walk around hand-picked areas, but it was not going to be a project about hand-picked areas. And then it came, you know, sort of the discussions about, well, you know, patenting, patenting took up a lot, a lot of time. Should the sequence be patented? Should it not be patented? It, should it be patented to protect it from being, you know, sort of patented as it were? So there should be a sort of an open wrap around it, um, you know, sort of um, and people's views on that. And then a lot of, uh, I think I can remember a lot of time being taken up with, you know, talking about whether with different, the different international groups about whether sequence release was going to be viable um, because not, because the, the one of the initial, you know, um, Bermuda principles that was was put up on the board was that finished sequence should be released as soon as possible. The the databases took finished sequence, and that was being being held back in 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 the projects. Um, you know, people's people's careers, people's interests, having to you know uh, progress and have a publication and mine it for as much as they can mine it for before before it goes anywhere. So um, yeah, so that that's my recollection of you know what was what was being talked about, and, and then and then subsequent to that, there were in subsequent meetings the the idea of the whole genome. So, you know, should should there be a should it be a whole genome sequence? And there was a group of people who thought that you know whole genome sequencing was was feasible, and that was the way to go, rather than this mapping and and you know, sequencing clones stuff. Uh, <laughs> that, that, 
you know went to the that went to the Solera side eventually, uh, eventually. But you know initially there was a there was a you know very um, very healthy debate about whether this would be a, a viable proposition and whether whether that would be the because the other the other big thing I think this was occupying Francis's mind at the time was whether the time anywhere around there was right for for scaling up. Because he had Bob on the one side saying, you know, start now, you can change it, you can change the technology, incorporate more new technology as, as you go along, but we should get going. And then you would have other people, and I would imagine Eric would be one of these, saying, no, 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 the technology is not there at the moment. You know, it's very, very manual, very, you know, you can't go with you can't go with this. That has there have to be more improvements before it's ready to go. So did, did um, cr uh, chromosome alloc did allocation come up at, at any point? Was, yes, it was that. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, it yes it did. Um, and I mean, we at, certainly at the Sanger we we had a pre discussion about you know sort of what we were proposing to sequence, um, and I suppose we were we were getting in there first. So I mean, chromosome twenty-two was, you know, that was on our our books. That came with um, I mean, Ian Denham and the map, and a great encouragement from David Weatherall, one of the um, the Wellcome Trust governors. You know, it was a small chromosome. Make your mark. Show what you can do with it, and and get there first. Now he was, now he was a really strong advocate of that. Uh, the X chromosome um, was an interest of David's. Lots of people were interested in the X chromosome, though, and a little, um, really, a consortium of groups interested in the X was was put together to to work on that. Once once essentially it was said that Sanger would sequence it. Um, chromosome six was an early one of ours, um, and that came with Stefan Beck, uh, who was interested in in the MHC. Another another wonderful region to be starting off with. <laughs> um, and so yes, those were our first ones. And I think, you know, and, and they, those were associated with people in the UK who had been working on, on previous projects. Beyond that, um, David came up with a list. I mean, 20 was the next one that was included in the in the first group to get us to one sixth of the of the genome. And then when you know we when we put in for for the for the next um, for the next sixth, really we were looking at which chromosomes hadn't been taken by other groups. And I can remember um, in that first meeting that so they were interested in the um, the DOE had interests on 5, 16, and 19. They'd had mapping, pro they'd had cosmic mapping projects on, on all of those chromosomes, and they stuck with, with, with those chromosomes. The Japanese were on chromosome 21, as well as collaborating with Ian on, on 22. Um, and Bruce Rowe was also interested in, in parts of 22. Um, and those are the ones that stand out. And I know that um, David Cox, Cox, I think, um, in Stanford was involved in, with, um, it, he was involved in some sequencing on chromosome four, but eventually that chromosome went to, went, went to Washu. But the, so it, it really, you know, the division went along, um, previous interests for the most part, certainly to start with. France put in a bid for a chromosome and I think they got funding for um, chromosome 14. I'm not sure whether they, there was anybody in France who was interested in that or whether that was an untaken chromosome at the time. Not, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure about that. So that's my recollection of of how it worked, but you you know from from the Sanger's point of view, 
we felt that, you know, we put ourselves in the driving seat um, because that was the strategy that we were we were following and, and we we had the funding to to move ahead with it. So a related question is, as these sequencing groups and mapping groups were sort of diminishing in, in number, did you think, and uh, the Human Genome Project was concentrating, do you th did you think there was any kind of loss in innovation, uh, or was it more of a process of, of uh, the, the, the methods just worked better with groups that knew better what, what they were doing or something, something of that sort. <laughs> I think we reached a stage where we had to, yeah, yes, you, you needed to, it worked better with groups who were familiar and, and, and had put in a lot of work to refine the process. Every time you have in it, trouble with innovation, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but then things shoot off at a tangent. And you don't always get back to the path that you originally set out on. So there was quite a long period of, should we say, trying trying things out. Nobody ever stopped trying things to improve the process. But I think we consolidated on what we needed to do. And there were only limited ways in which in which to do that. And the what and the, then con concentrating it in the big centers. I mean, it, it took it out of the small centres, which some people would be aggrieved at. But if you label it as a factory um, repetitive process, did they really want to be doing it? And did they want to be doing it, you know, to standards set by somebody else, et cetera, in the timescale set by somebody else? And I think a lot of groups didn't want to do that. They were... They were quite happy to have it done as long as they, you know, could ha also have some say over what it was that was done. And lots of people used to gripe about the quality. <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, quite, that's quite interesting because it's a very big uh, debate among historians of science of, what's the connection between sort of innovation and scientific success and whether it's good to have lots of groups working on one problem or a constellation of problems or whether it's better to have standardization centralization of methods and there's a big debate about about uh, innovation in the human genome project um one one, one follow-up question i had was once uh, centers got really established and really standardized on what they were doing. Did you, did you have a, a, a good sense of, say, whether one group was really, really good at, or one center was really good at production while another group was really good at finishing? Do, do you remember sort of any, 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 any groups that you thought were really good at, at say, one part of the sequencing process versus another? And, and why, why did you think that was? Well, I think, I think we were, um, well, we, I mean, we were pretty well aware of what was going on in, in WashU because we, we had regular visits there and they regularly visited us. So I think once a year, either, you know, a group of people would go from Sanger to WashU or WashU or vice versa. When the, other centres became involved in the in the consortium, so the, the consortium project. Then the visits the, the visits widened, so there would be you know more people coming from the uh, the Whitehead or from or from Baylor and, and vice versa. So so people used to go and the people to keep an eye on um, always wash you because they they were very you know hot on development and they had good links with with the companies producing the new, the new reagents and, you know, the new gadgets and so on. Um, the Broad were interesting once they got that production line up and running. And they were most interesting because it seemed when you talk to them that it worked so well. All, almost all of the time, and we just didn't believe that. 
but you know <laughs> that was <laughs> um but it generated it, it you know it, it you know, produced secrets and it was impressive the way that they'd set it up as the, as the you know the the long flow pipeline that you see you know in the, in the human genome paper the first one um so Baylor Baylor were quite they were sort of quite consistent they came through on the finishing and the innovation in the fin on the finishing side quite often um Again, I mean, WashU were, we talk so regularly with WashU and there were, there was a lot of interchange of the finishing groups on, you know, on both sides and the exchange of information about, you know, what we were doing and trying and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's my perception. JGI, they were trying, they were trying new things, but didn't get the impression that they're, production facility was going that well um, but they picked up once the once they moved on to the the finishing which was with Rick Myers and, and Jeremy Schmutz that that was that they, they did some they did some nice nice things what do people say about us did they say that oh sorry we're the ones to watch <laughs> or they didn't have much of a production set up it did take us a long time to fully automate the production side. I think I think we were probably we were we were probably slow on that. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned at all, which comes up also in, in the a little bit in the Bermuda meeting, but becomes a significant issue in uh, 97, 98, is the uh, library the library production Peter De Young's sort of facility. Um, Prior to that, uh, library development was was pretty haphazard, at least in the the U.S. So, what was sort of Peter's contribution? You know, how did his facility get so good at library development, not only for human but for nearly everything else? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, because he was interested. Uh, he was. He was. He was really interested in making comprehensive libraries. And because the first libraries of his that we use were the P1 artificial chromosome of the PAX, um, which had a pretty good um, coverage, I think. But uh, they were, you know, they became they became unethical. So um, but I, th I think it was that he was really interested personally in, in getting the technology to work. And, you know, he's, well, it was really noticeable in, in the genome project that some people had green fingers and other people didn't. And Peter did in that area. And, and where you have put somebody like that, that's, a, you know, you, you want them to carry out that special, specialized work. So I think I think people I think the people were very happy with with his libraries, and he was willing you know he was willing to to talk about what he was what he was doing and what he was trying, and you know the idea of having you know, that he started off with a what were the first ones um, one hundred and twenty kb, and then he then he started increasing the the site you know sort of pushing to see how far. He could increase the size of the clone, but also and and but also you know keep the coverage. Yeah, you know, what was dropping? Have a look at what was dropping out. So yeah, I think I think that was that was it. And I think he was probably also interested in in how you know the different DNA behaved in different ways you know, from the from the different organism. Um, I mean, we did the zebrafish, and I mean asked me some questions about differences in genomes. Well, the zebrafish is uh, a challenging genome, shall we say. Um, it's very AC rich and it's very polymorphic. So, and a lot of the polymorphism is in long stretches of, of A's and T's. Um, and we started out initially with a, um, a, because of the amount of DNA that was required, a, a, a polymorphic back library 
which caused all, us all sorts of problems in terms of putting them out together and, and also the sequence assembly. But he was very happy to work with um, a group in, in Oregon on you know, developing a back library from a single zebrafish. And you know, sort of interested in getting down to working with those very small amounts of, of DNA. Um, so he's, I think he was just interested in, you know, in, in doing it. So one of the things that we haven't talked about is the sort of the number numbers of organisms you've you've sort of overseen the sequencing of, and, and a good general question uh, would be sort of wh what makes a good sort of sequencing target? Um, and, um, sort of what are the f defining features of that organism uh, for all you know, um, and what makes it you know, many, many organisms don't make it beyond, say, draft, a draft sequence. So when you have a complete model, that means that a significant amount of work has been put into it, obviously. So do you have any sense of why one model makes it to that stage and, and other models don't? Uh, so the, what makes a good, so I, I, I suppose a, a genome, that's kind to sequencers is um, it, uh, no no extremes of, of of base bias, no extreme GC content or AT content. Both both of them cause problems. So not platypus. <laughs> <laughs> not platypus. You, for me, you can take zebrafish out. I thought that was a horrid genome. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's sort of interesting that when we we, we started off with with yeast, um, and the yeast groups actually moved over to pathogen sequencing at the at the Sanger, and the first two projects that they started out with, one was TB, high high GC content in there, and the other one was malaria, which is at the other end of the extreme with AT content. So, I mean, very educational in terms of, you know, sort of having to manipulate the DNA to, to make sure that we got the sequence covered, the right sequence coverage. But in terms of informed choice, I would think, you know, probably not the best to, to you know, start out with. So I would say, yes, not, not any ex extreme bias. Um, I think a, a, an organism that makes a lot of DNA <laughs> would be a good so you're not struggling around for minute minute quantities um and then of the organisms what were you were saying the organisms that i've been involved with um the strategy the strategy was evolving all the time and, and actually the you know which strategy you adopt does tend to follow trends so the mapping followed by sequencing approach is a good way for getting the coverage, for knowing where you are, for providing resources that can be distributed to a community in, in the form of clones if they want to do you know, research with it, um, and, for, and for completing the, the sequence because you know where you are. Whole genome shotgun is a way of getting coverage quickly. Um, if it goes together nicely, there is, if it assembles well, you can get good coverage. You can get a very, very usable sequence for a lot of purposes. If you want, if you really want a resource covering the whole genome for a detailed research project, I think you've got to go, you've got to go deeper than that. You've got to be able to improve on it and whole genome shotgun is very what well, was very difficult to finish on because you couldn't always target the the regions that that were missing i mean it was difficult enough with if you were trying to work you know in gaps between clones you knew you knew where the you know dna piece of dna that you're interested in should go but they, they, if you're then going and trying to hook it out from from you know the, the DNA in order to get a piece to sequence. 
but if you haven't if you don't really you know you, if you haven't got that much information i think i think for a usable genome you've got to have mapping information combined with sequencing information and mapping has become untrendy and i was berated on more than one occasion by you and bernie for being backward in the way that i was i was you know going about genomes but the i tended to if people ask me about doing a genome project i tended to ask them first what what they wanted to do with the data if you want a you know an overall analysis for the data that's one project you know very often the whole genome shotgun would give you that if you want if you want to base a you know a very detailed research project on it you need to have you know improved sequence and at least the areas that you're interested in and and you have to have a way of doing that so um yeah we had some no, it's a it's a fascinating debate because I had the same conversation with Harris Lewin about whether all all good sequence and all good analysis needs good maps, mm -hmm. and he was really adamant that with shotgun you cannot get the analysis that you need for many questions of evolution and questions of of say compar for comparative questions. Yeah, um, and he was he was. Uh, very leery of, of not doing um, sort of the, a more traditional approach of, of mapping and then uh, uh, high dense mapping and then sequencing. Um, as and uh, he he didn't think mapping was un, was unfashionable <laughs> at all. He was the op he was, he was the opposite. He the op yeah, he had the opposite impression that in fact. That that was the only way you could you could interrogate the data. The, the, that was the only way to produce sequence of good good quality and contiguity yeah. um, for for the types of organisms that he was looking at and the types of questions that he wanted to answer. Um, yeah, yeah. This is a, I mean, it really does depend on on what you want to. Know. It may be you know as I mean. The move, mapping become un, becoming untrendy, plus the move to short sequence reads, it ex exacerbates the problem. But it may be that, you know, if the reads are, are now getting longer, you can get better, better assemblies from just sequence data, then, you know, it may improve. But I still think, I mean, you've still got to have a map of some sort, just to link, you know, the genetic side of things with the, with the sequence, I think. Right. I was going to follow up and say, with long read sequencing becoming the next big thing, um, <laughs> does that, that does that abrogate the need for 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 dense maps? And it it may do. It may do. It depends on how. Again, it depends on on how good the sequence is. You know, you you can if you've got you know five hundred kb of rubbish, then you know <laughs> or n. You know, this is not terribly helpful. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And the wheat genome, which is, I mean, the wheat genome. So I, I became involved in that project after I had left the Sanger and I set up the a sequencing centre in Norwich. Um, and we, the, we were working at that, the centres based on the, the John Innes site. And they were already, the group there, Mike Bevan's group, were already working as part of the Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium. And they had a strategy within the consortium that was already, you know, sort of worked out that they were going to use mapping and then sequencing to, to um, get at the genome. And the reason for that is, I mean, the genome of wheat is enormous I mean it's 15 about 14 15 gigabases it's hexaploid so you've got three diploid genomes in there three non-identical diploid genomes that, that make up the, the whole um, but you've got gene complements that are very similar on um, on each of the, the sets of chromosomes and um, over 85 percent repletes so you know, just a just a few challenges there. 
But um, it, actually, you asked about technology mm-hmm. and the back libraries. So in the wheat, there is um, a lab in, in the Czech Republic run by Yaroslav Dolazil. And what he does, he flow sorts chromosomes and he developed a method for flow sorting the individual wheat chromosomes and then making back libraries from them. So, you know, the ability to do that and those resources um, are in the in the plant arena. You know, it's similar to, to what Peter de Jong was doing in the in the, in the animal area. Um, but yes, what what Yaroslav was was able to do with his his flow sorting chromosomes. So where not all of the chromosomes can be quite cleanly prepared, but they're they're pretty good. And the first pilot project was run on um, chromosome three B, which is the largest. And that's just a gigabase. Um, and that was a project that was led by Catherine Foyer in uh, in France uh, with Genoscope doing sequencing. And that sort of set the template for 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 the genome. The the other con, yeah, other consortium members, and this really was an international project committed to producing physical maps. Um, initially, using fluorescent fingerprinting, and and more latterly using um, pooled backs with um, tag sequences uh, to, to produce maps. And it was at that, when the technology got to that stage that, that in Norwich, we, we joined in with that. But um, the, finally, the NR gene came um, sort of towards the end of the project, probably around 2016. NRG or 2017, NRG came up with a method for um, assembling these large genomes from uh, large, highly repetitive genomes from short Illumina reads. And they developed a, a, a genome sequence for, for the wheat. But what we were able to do was then add in all of the resources that had been generated previously. So the physical maps, backend sequences, sequence tags from from mapped backs, um, chromosome specific shotgun reads, shotgun data, so that we knew you know which chromosome you know sequences lined up on. Um, I put all that together, and I think the product was was pretty good in the end, actually, for for a genome of that type. Subsequently, they've added in some bio-nano data, um, bio-nanoport data, and some more um, shotgun sequence data and resolve some of the, the problems. But you know, if, if, if after, a first, after the first round, you're resolving with, with, the, with the additional bio-nano mapping information, you know, 10% of problems, that's not bad. It's not bad at all. And I think I think it's actually proving to be quite a, you know quite a useful resource for for research, which is what the intention was. So that and, and I as I say when I was at, in Norwich, we we started off the, the the sequencing side of things and generated whole chromosome shotgun sequence data, which assembled into you know two to six KB context, really rewarding. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it but it was useful in terms of positioning um, and 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 giving a, a a first I think genome wide glimpse at genes. So it was you know useful to a, useful to a lot of people. And then I I worked with the consortium afterwards um, when 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 I um, stepped down from Norwich, um, just helping to you know guide i think the process to, to towards getting the whole genome but yeah in, an interesting project mm. so i actually think we've gone through almost all of my questions <laughs> <laughs> um one 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 person we haven't mentioned at all and i, I just want to discuss him briefly it's michael morgan um oh, yeah. yeah so we forgot <laughs> we forgot michael Morgan. so i guess in in just thinking about his uh, uh, role and uh, role at Sanger, his contribution, a few one or two anecdotes, something like that. Two anecdotes. 
Oh, yes. So, well, Michael... Um, yeah, my, Michael was there as a sort of... I mean, both to encourage us um, as a sort, and in ways a sort of fixer, but also as a minder, I think, and um, to make sure that we didn't go completely off the rails. But also, he, I mean, he played such an important role once we once we were going at integrating what we were doing at the Sanger with what was you know with the international project and and it, you know with John worked on keeping the project as an international project when there was you know a threat at one time that it wasn't going to be um two threats actually but you know that, that, so so um so Michael yeah Michael used to you <laughs> what can I say I mean it used to come and and you know, talk with John about about what we were doing, and you know, of course, he he came from the administrator side of the of the Wellcome Trust, so you know, it was in, in. I mean, I had to go down and and you know justify how we were spending money at, at various times, but also he wanted he wanted the Sanger to be a success. He enjoyed it, um, and. He sort of encouraged he, he he encouraged us and he didn't encourage us to break the rules. I just have one one you know I've got there are two 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 big memories of Michael. One is when we were talking about the the pathogen sequencing. The, the Wellcome Trust used to get quite agitated at times that we didn't go over budget on you know any in any particular area. And we knew that to finish what we were doing on TB, we were going to go over budget and only a certain budget had been allocated. And um, I had gone down, I can't remember whether I was John, was John or whether I was, I was probably with Bart actually. No, I, no, I was with John. And, and we, we talked about this with them saying that, you know, we are going, you know, that we cannot finish within, within the budget. We've not been profligate, but we can't finish it. Um, and, you know, he was, you know, basically told us, you know, the, the, the message was, this was very bad. This was a very bad thing to do. And then it was almost, you know, sort of as we walked out of the room, said, but you better go on and do it. <laughs> you know? You get you can get chastised later because it's very bad that you go over budget, but you know, continue the project, continue the project, and then and then the celebrations. I think Michael, you know, we always remember Michael for for the celebrations. He enjoyed a party, and when the Sanger was a success, and you know when we you know made our contribution to the to the um, you know the initial draft of the human genome project and then when we when we got it completed you know he was we, i just had the pictures of him on the steps of the of the house that the welcome trust had, had renovated um and you know that was uh you know with a champagne bottle in his hand you know, sort of cheering cheering everybody on but he was he was hugely instrumental in in making the international coordination work hugely just knew how to do it knew how to talk to people you know get get people around the table um and john would you know talk to him about the shall we say the the sharpest points um, that, that need to be got across, but often my, my, Michael did the diplomacy.